Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all once again. My name is Mariam Pira. I am the coordinator for the local wheel group here in Chicago. I'm joined by my co-conspirator, Darius, as well as our friends from Commonweal, Gabriella, and of course, our wonderful hosts from the Bernadine Center at CTU. Thanks, Peter, for running the show and keeping us all going. And we're very excited to welcome Jeff Corgan as our speaker for this evening's program. Uh, and before I uh, share a little bit about Jeff and his bio, I'm going to sort of uh, get some housekeeping out of the way. First of all, if you wouldn't mind, please keeping your microphones muted uh, during the program, just to make sure we're not uh, interfering and interrupting the, the speaker as they present, we would appreciate it. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't want you participating. Please do feel free to use the chat to ask questions, share comments and thoughts, articles, quotes, anything uh, that you'd love to share with the group. We would love to hear about it. Um, and we'll also be monitoring the chat as, it, as the program goes on for questions, um, which we will take after Jeff's finished his presentation. We'll go through a Q&A. We'll invite you to unmute your mics, turn your video on, and, and share your thoughts and questions. So with that, I will give a very brief introduction uh, to Jeff Corgan. He's a church consultant providing planning, coaching, and evaluation services for several Catholic organizations, including Leadership Roundtable and the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. Jeff is also the author of several books, as well as several social justice-themed comic books. He's currently working on a graphic biography of Dorothy Day, who's the star of our program this evening. Jeff, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, uh, Miriam. And um, it's great to be with you all. I even recognize some of the names. And um, I think some of the people on the call could probably do this, um, you know, lead this talk. So, um, so I'm going to, with great humility, just offer some few thoughts at the beginning about Dorothy Day and her candidacy for sainthood, uh, which I've been working on for seven years. The, um, the archdiocese opened up the canonization cause in the year 2000. Um, with uh, Cardinal O'Connor, and uh, very little happened for years and years, and then Cardinal Dole got a hold of it and said, hey, let's, let's get this done, and so for the last seven years, we've been gathering evidence. Now, when I first started, I thought this was like a project where, you know, the thesis of a paper was Dorothy Day would make a great saint, but what I learned instead, it's a trial, and the trial is not trying to determine anyone's guilt or innocence, but did she live a life of heroic virtue? And I'm going to just run through um, a few slides here just to kind of put that, put that out there. And there's that great quote, don't call me a saint. Dorothy Day's most popular quote, most used quote, she loved people living in poverty. She fought for workers. She tried to um, promote pacifism. But the most often uh, quoted phrase of hers is, don't call me a saint. I don't want to be dismissed that easily. Um, this trial is about, did she live a life of heroic virtue? OK, so what does that mean? Um, we look first at the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, and then the cardinal virtues, prudence, temperance, fortitude, justice. So you just create a question for each one of those virtues. Did Dorothy Day live faith heroically? Did Dorothy Day live hope heroically? Did she live charity heroically, prudence heroically, temperance heroically, fortitude heroically, justice heroically? And that is the question that this court at the Congregation for the Causes of Saints is going to take up. Now, we have been working for seven years to assemble all of this evidence. Now, the first thing you should know, if you're thinking about becoming a saint yourself, don't write too much stuff down because everything has to be reviewed by theologians that you publish and a lot of your unpublished and all of your diaries. We have a 10,000 page diary, which Gabriella, who's on the, on the um, call with us here, 
uh, was one of our first transcribers. Um, don't let anyone tell you that they had good handwriting back in the day. Dorothy's is terrible. And we had a hundred transcribers all over the world transcribe these 10,000 pages of diaries. So it all has to be poured over by theologians. Uh, they're called theological censors. Uh, great word, right? Theological censor. They um, look at it in, in light of Catholic teaching and uh, morals and then pronounce a judgment on all of this. Now, Dorothy Day, you know, not only was she a great diarist, she wrote a lot of letters. Uh, we picked 500 of her greatest hits and letters that uh, we transcribed and are being looked at. And then she also was, I.F. Stone, who founded The Nation magazine, described her as one of the great journalists of the 20th century. So, you know, here's a, here's a candidate for sainthood who, not only was a journalist, but she had her own newspaper. Um, so there's a lot of stuff. So when people say, why is this taking so long? It's really because she wrote so much. Um, we also uh, took testimonies, just like in a regular court, from people who knew her. We were able to um, interview, uh, take testimony from 35 people who knew her. And now we're just finishing up with interviewing uh, selected uh, Catholic bishops from around the country about their view on her. And um, then we'll be you know, interviewing the uh, historical commission that produces a report and so forth. So a lot of work goes into producing this evidence. And um, I would like to just kind of go over the, um, the origin story with you. Um, can, can people just, hit the on the reaction button, hit a, a thumbs up or a, a raise your hand if you know kind of the origin story of the Catholic worker um, that you've you've heard of this. Okay, we've got a we've got a few folks. So I won't belabor this, but I'd like to I'd like to both bring in some things that you may not be familiar with. Um, but also give you a little preview of Dorothy Day, the graphic biography that I'm working on with, a, with an artist. And the first place we start is the great San Francisco earthquake. Uh, Dorothy Day is a young girl, she's like eight or 10 years old. And suddenly during you know, the early morning hours, it's the middle of the night to her, um, the ground starts shaking, um, mom, grabs her little brother and runs out of the house, or little sister and runs out of the house. Uh, dad grabs the two boys and runs out of the house. And Dorothy is left in the house and the, the house is shaking, she's screaming, and her parents get outside and look at each other and say, where's Dorothy? Now, would you think somebody who gets left behind like this would have some kind of some kind of affinity for people who get left behind in our society. Yeah, I think there's something to that. Um, what you're seeing before you is what Dorothy saw is the, um, the works of mercy being performed by the citizens of Oakland in churches and in unions. Um, to respond to the refugees that poured over from San Francisco into Oakland. Apparently, people in Oakland uh, slept later than people in San Francisco. People in San Francisco had lit the fires in the houses um, at the time of the earthquake. So that's why San Francisco burned down and Oakland didn't. And so they went over and um, the people of Oakland took care of them. And you see Dorothy in that little inset panel at the bottom right. Mother, why can't people treat each other like this all the time? That actually happened. Um, some of the stories you hear about Dorothy Day didn't actually happen, but this is one that, that this is one that really happened. And so Dorothy uh, grows up into a young adult who wants to become a journalist, and like a few of us, maybe even on this call, goes to New York to pursue her dream of becoming a journalist. And she makes some interesting friends. Now, the, the narrative that you hear a lot is, you know, Dorothy Day lived a life of dissipation until she found Jesus. And 
you know, the thing is, she lived a life like a lot of young adults who come to New York to seek their fortune. She got together with her friends and drank and talked about big ideas. One of those friends was Eugene O'Neill, who you see here reciting a poem that he did at this, this uh, bar they used to go to called the Hell Hole. Um, he, he read uh, this, this poem called um, The Hound of Heaven. Uh, some of you may have read about God pursuing uh, somebody, even though they don't, they don't want to meet God and God keeps going after them. And this is how Eugene O'Neill felt. And uh, he and Dorothy would talk late into the night and drink and chat with their friends. And um, Dorothy sang Frankie and Johnny, you know, and that. So they had a, they had a good time, you know. And uh, this business of a life of dissipation, you know, what what really changed for her of the more innocent, you know, getting um, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, New York scene of the literary and the radicals. And, you know, she worked on these radical newspapers. Um, she watched a friend overdose on heroin uh, because he had been jilted by his, um, his lover. And she was the only one who stayed in the bar to take care of him, except for his sister. You know, Eugene Neal, who had been a classmate, high school classmate of the fellow, he ran too. They all ran. And she thought, you know, how can you be talking about building a better world and then just run like that when a friend of yours does this? So she sank into a depression and then kind of came out of it. She went into nursing at that point and she came out of it with the pandemic, right, of 100 years ago. And she came out of that and then fell in love with kind of a, a fatal attraction, a, a very charismatic reporter who said he taught Ernest Hemingway everything he knew about writing, you know. And um, he was quite a dashing fellow, but also a, a bit of a cad. And uh, Dorothy became pregnant and uh, he pressured her to have an abortion. She had the abortion. Uh, he took off anyway. And she uh, had a couple of suicide attempts and then, um, you know, really fell into a, a, a deep uh, depression until she wrote a cathartic novel, which um, had decent sales, but not so hot reviews. The New York Times called it an adolescent novel. And, um, she, but it got picked up uh, by one of the movie, movie uh, producing uh, organizations and so they they were going to make a movie of it and they paid Dorothy money she bought a cottage in Staten Island and kind of got into the literary scene there and on the beach in Staten Island and met uh, the love of her life Forster Batterham she became pregnant then and she um, had uh, Tamar then now Dorothy you know had this conflict and we could spend hours on this it's so interesting and uh, Klejman who's on the call has done a wonderful uh, detective work on everything that was going on in Staten Island back then and uh, that's a great story in and of itself but they you know Dorothy um, says you know I want to get baptized I want Tamar baptized uh, I want us to get married and Forster's is you know an anarchist and says, you know, well, I don't believe in marriage. And, you know, Robert Ellsberg has pointed out that Forster's anarchist belief seems to have only extended to marriage. Um, but, you know, there's not a lot of evidence that he was much of an anarchist, but he told, held the line at, at, at marriage. So Dorothy, um, you know, kicks him out and that's a great heartbreak for her. A second heartbreak is she's Catholic but she's still drawn to the social issues that her friends who are socialists, anarchists, and communists are working on. And so she comes up with a really novel idea. She says, I think I can cover these events for the Catholic press. And so she goes to the Hunger March of 1932, and she uh, covers that with uh, Mary Heaton Vorse. She, she rooms with an old friend from the Masses magazine, and um, they covered the, the, um, the Hunger March, uh, which is organized by you know, communists and socialists and anarchists. And um, she feels like, hey, these are my people in one sense because they care about this. I'm sitting alone at mass. Uh, nobody's talking about, you know, workers. 
And I, I don't know what to do because also I've let that life. I'm not, um, I'm not going to be a part of the communist movement. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be a Catholic. So she says, how can I put all this together? And so she goes to the shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington. It's being built. The crypt church is there. So she goes down into the crypt. It still looks a lot like, you know, the 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 art it, that um, Christopher has done here. Um, the the one on the left is uh, a character from the Brothers Karamazov. It's you won't find it at um, the uh, Catholic University, um, but anyway, uh, she prays that God might help her to use her gifts to help workers and the poor. And she gets on the bus, goes back to the apartment she shares with her brother, and her sister-in-law says, Tamar has the measles, you got to come. And there's this odd Frenchman who wants to speak with you. Okay, and that is Peter Morin. Um, and uh, he's hectoring the doctor right there. I mean, he just will talk to anybody about his radical ideas. And this is, this is uh, you know, one of the comic parts of the, the movie, uh, the Dorothy Day movie. But it's really true. He was like that. And, Dor and he, he becomes Dorothy's tutor. And I think this is the... Uh, this is the last, this is the last uh, panel I'm going to show you, but, you know, this really captures Peter. This is a scene of him in, in uh, Union Square, but, you know, talking about his three-point program, which becomes our three-point program as Doris these tutor, that they're going to have roundtable discussions on the clarification of thought to help workers become scholars. They're going to build houses of hospitality, like in the Middle Ages, and then they're going to build farming communes, uh, he calls them agronomic universities, where, you know, you farm by day and learn together and study at night, write poetry, play your violin, you know, those kinds of things, very, very beautiful vision. Um, so Peter is, um, you know, uh, teaching Dorothy all that he knows about the lives of the saints and the um, Catholic social teaching uh, those kinds of things. I mean, Dorothy didn't come into the church because of Catholic social teaching. She came into the church because she became pregnant with Tamar and she thought she could never have children again after the horrible abortion she had. So that was out of gratefulness. But um, Peter teaches her this and they decide to start this movement together, the Catholic worker. And so that's the origin story. Um, Dorothy goes on to create this amazing movement. Peter lives till about 1949, um, and he's kind of in and out a little bit um, because of he, he develops dementia at some point. Um, and um, I want to just finish with my own thought about the uh, life of heroic virtue um, and tell you just a quick story about Dorothy that um, she and Forster kept in touch, but she really kept the boundaries up. And Forster found another partner whom he lived with for about 30 years, and then she developed cancer and um, she was dying. And he got in touch with Dorothy and, you know, part of me wants to just kick him, but he, he gets in touch with Dorothy and said, well, you know, she's got the Catholic worker going now for like 20 years. And he says, you know, you take care of people in need. Like um, my partner uh, is dying. Could you take care of her? And she says, okay. And she goes out to Staten Island back to her old house and he rents a house in Staten Island and she takes care of, of, of Agnes. And um, when I think, I mean, any of us who have had romantic entanglements uh, will appreciate this, you know, is that heroic virtue? I'd say so. We've all got lots of lists of how Dorothy has heroic virtue, but that would, strangely enough, that would be on the top of my list. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in charge of this thing, but that would be mine. And then the last thing I'd like to end with on a saint for our time, Here's Dorothy, and I think a lot of you have seen this picture of her before, where she's at the United Farm Workers uh, picket line in 1973, and around her are San Bernardino County um, uh, sheriffs, deputy sheriffs, and they're not fans, you know, they're, they're not happy about this at all. And uh, 
Dorothy kind of reaches out to one of them and asks him where he's from. And he says, uh, Pennsylvania, and he gives the town. And Dorothy says, was, was your father a coal miner? Because she knows that part of Pennsylvania. And he says, yes, as a matter of fact, he was. And she says, I walked the picket line with them. And she says the name of the local union. And from that point on, this sheriff's deputy was very deferential towards her, made sure she had water, made sure she was okay. I mean, she was elderly and had heart trouble at that time and was very deferential to her the entire rest of the uh, time of the demonstration. So you think about today and the division in our country, Dorothy, you know, could have been very uh, tart with him. She was known for being sarcastic, but she tried to make a connection and she made a connection around the man's own narrative that his dad had been a coal miner and had worked hard and the union was one of the reasons he um, had a decent life, that, that the son had a decent life. And Dorothy was making the connection between his father and this demonstration. And he got it because of the frame that he understood. So I'll just pause there. You know, I was telling Gabriella earlier that, you know, we could do a five day conference on this and not exhaust everything. So I've just hit some things that I thought would be interesting to you as, as we begin. So Miriam, back to you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Yeah, I can I can see even just the, the story that you highlighted. I'm thinking about myself and going, eh, I don't know if I would have, <laughs> I would have been able to do that. I wouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not so, a saint. Well, yeah, there's that, right? Don't, <laughs> don't call me a saint. Don't call me a saint, is that exactly. <laughs> so I see Gabriella has posted it in the chat. Thank you. Please do feel free to post your questions in the chat or raise your hands um, on the Zoom reactions and we'll start calling folks. But we would love to hear from you and, and your questions or comments. Nobody ever wants to be the first one. Well, okay, Jeff, I asked you this during our prep, but you didn't really get to answer it because it was sort of spoilery. So how did you come to find Dorothy Day? Oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I, I was, um, I was kind of different than Dorothy. Like I got drawn into the church because of Catholic social teaching and, um, also, you know, my, my play, home in Louisiana, there was a, a Benedictine monastery near it. So once I got into Catholic social teaching, I got into kind of the Benedictine um, prayer and, and so forth. Um, but Dorothy, for me, I was like, you know, Bono says about Christianity, um, I'm a fan, but I'm not in the band. Um, that, that was kind of me and um, the Catholic worker. And part of it was the, the absolute commitment to pacifism, which I'm learning, you know, as I learned a little of the history, you find like, well, a lot of Catholic workers, you know, they, they went and enlisted in World War II and you know, things like that. And, and today there's, there's people who are, um, you know, when you sit down and talk to people at Catholic worker houses, they say, well, you know, I actually don't believe that either. I mean, one of the things I didn't get about it was what an anarchist movement it is. But there, there is a real commitment to nonviolence that Dorothy had and insisted upon. And, um, you know, she loved the people that left and, you know, took some of them back in, you know, when they came back from the war. But um, for me, you know, it, my, my book on Catholic Relief Services is a chapter on the genocide in, in Rwanda and the church's role in doing healing afterwards. And, you know, I just think that um, a strict application of just war would have um, kept the number of deaths in the tens of thousands instead of the 800,000, which it ended up being. So I tend to be more of a, a just war guy, certainly not the way it's applied by American presidents, but um, so I never really could make that full leap. But she has been a, a character, you know, I, I had a spiritual director who said he has a painting of Dorothy Day right across from his bed. So he wakes up and he's, he told me, he says, there she is staring me down again. And the idea is that she holds us accountable to fidelity to the gospel, that when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, you know, we're supposed to do something about that. 
and um, and I think it's great. And she's kept me accountable too during the, especially during the parts of this process that I've had a chance to read more of her writing and and uh, meet the people giving testimony and and that kind of thing. Um, that it does, she does get under your skin and change you, even if you don't get into the movement. And that's one of the reasons I think she's so popular with young adults is that she has a a life, you know, her young adulthood is like a lot of young adults' lives. And, and then she, um, she took the faith seriously enough, you know, to, to do what she did. And that is um, incredibly inspiring. And that's why I think she's a, lived a life of heroic virtue is that she, that ultimate uh, extreme fidelity to the gospel. Thank you for that. So Janice in the chat asks, uh, where do things currently stand in regards to the cause for sainthood? Oh, great question. Um, and I, I'm sorry I didn't say that in the beginning, but yeah, let's jump into that. She um, is currently a um, servant of God, which is a title that all of the candidates for sainthood um, get. And that means you're an official candidate. It's not just people talk about you, you know, my mother was a saint, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, no, she's actually a candidate. And then an official inquiry starts in the diocese in which the person died. And so for Dorothy, that's New York. And so the inquiry involves, um, you know, that whole trial um, of did she live a life of heroic virtue? And so the finding all her publications, um, putting, um, you know, getting all of those uh, eyewitnesses to come to New York and, and be interviewed by um, the Cardinal's delegate for this, all of those kinds of things. So where it stands now is at um, the Archdiocese of New York headquarters, it's called 1011, because it's uh, 1011 First Avenue, uh, 55th and 56th Streets in between them. And um, on the seventh floor is an office that has three locked cabinets each cabinet has boxes and boxes and boxes of Dorothy Day evidence. And the last time I calculated, which was like maybe two or three weeks ago, it was over 40,000 pages. Um, each box has 300 to 350 pages of evidence in it, which will be bound at a book bindery in Rome and turned into actual volumes that will be read. So. The timing of all this is that we pretty much have everything done, but there's a few weird things that they require us to do. And so we're just making sure they're done right. And by that, I mean, you have to, the, it, it, the, the, the margins of the pages have to be shifted to the right. Um, this is like totally in the weeds, but <laughs> how does it stand? Well, we're just moving everything to the right a little bit now. I mean, can you believe this? Um, <laughs> we, we were really done, except for a few more bishop interviews, and then just to wrap everything up. So my, my projection is that we should be having a kind of a, um, people are calling it a send-off ceremony, but it's really a canonical um, uh, part of the inquiry. When you close it off and send everything to the Vatican in the diplomatic pouch, which I don't know how big this thing is, but um, you know, at 40,000 pages, maybe it's like a Harry Potter relic or something. You just keep stuffing it in, but we're gonna, we're gonna send that stuff off, I think at the end of November. So then it'll probably take about a year for their staff to go through all this stuff. And then, make, then they've got to make a recommendation um, to the Pope and that'll, probably be some conversation among them. So it's between, probably between one year and a um, hundred years till they make a recommendation to the Pope. And uh, if it's this Pope, I think it'll be fine. I mean, you know, he said, you know, she was one of four great Americans, you know, uh, was it Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day. Um, so then the, um, the whole thing, if she gets declared venerable, okay, now we're not, we're not yet even to beatification, she's declared venerable based on her life. That, that, I used to think that meant old, but it means worthy of being venerated, you know? So that's like when people pray to her for miracles in, a ch you know, in the church and so forth. People are praying right now for miracles. And 
if she gets two miracles, she becomes a saint. The first miracle is beatification. The second miracle is uh, sainthood. And we have gotten submitted things that people have prayed for. And it's really important at this stage. They're called uh, graces and favors when they're ordinary things. You know, I lost my keys, so I prayed to St. Anthony and I found them. You know, that, you know, you can't prove at a canonical court that that's a miracle, but you, but it is like a favor, you know, like you, you see that people are praying to St. Anthony or, you know, Dorothy and, um, but, you know, what I've seen so far, we, there's a few like so-called miracles that, you know, we've, we've heard about and, you know, I mean, they, they need to be investigated, but I, I don't think there's any, um, there's anything yet that you just look at and say, oh, that's it, you know. I appreciate you referencing Harry Potter because I was thinking about Mary Poppins. So that's, uh, okay. that's so tell us more about that. More age appropriate. Oh, where are the forty thousand pages are going? going yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we could uh, get there faster too on that umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the way to travel. Uh, thank you for that. Um, there were a couple of other questions around canonization and miracles, sure. but I think you touched on them. So, um, but if folks have more specific questions or want more information, feel free to drop that in the chat again. Yeah, um, I'll just say that they tend to be medical in nature because there's this idea that you can't, there's not much that you can prove as a miracle, except if you have doctors testifying, there's no explanation for this other than, you know, what happened. Um, I think of you know, there was this saint um, from India that I actually met the nephew of when I was working with the Diocese of Matuch and doing planning for them. And, uh, and just, a, it was just, just an amazing story. It was a, you know, a boy with a clubbed foot and his foot, they prayed over him and his foot grew back and it's a normal foot now. I mean, that's okay. That's a miracle, right? You know, it's not just, I had a stomach ache and it went away, you know, it's like real miracle. I'm reminded I watched something, I can't keep track of time anymore because we live in COVID. I watched something on Netflix where somebody was at Lourdes uh, going through sort of their uh, their records around people being healed when they come to Lourdes. And it was mm. a doctor speaking uh, on the documentary and he had this big old file and he said, all this is medical and these two page pieces of paper are religion. Everything else was mm. sort of to what you're speaking to, Jeff, medical evidence that says there's no way these things could have happened um, right. scientifically. Yeah, we had a great one where somebody, uh, you know, called and said, yeah, I think, you know, I think this is a miracle for Dorothy Day. And, you know, he laid it out and I was like, hmm, this is interesting. You know, we really should send somebody out there. You know, we have a, we have a, a, a an MD who's a, a volunteer um kind of coordinates our transcriptions. Um, you know, it's totally different, you know, Dr. Joe, you know, and he, um, it, we were thinking of sending him out and everything. And then the guy says, yeah, I prayed to Dorothy Day and I prayed to Augustus Tolton and I prayed to, you know, it's like, oh God, you know, I, <laughs> you gotta pick one. You can't pick them all. I mean, from the point of view of the person wanting the miracle, you know, maybe it's a good idea to pray for so, to so many people, but it does not work in a canonical court to say like, this is a miracle because of uh, Dorothy Day. You know? Thank you. Um, Mary poses in the chat, where do you think Dorothy would be today in regards to current social movements? You know, which movements would she be sort of on the front lines of? Oh, that's a great question. And, you know, it's also one that um, gets to the um, use and abuse of a saint's name. You know, um, I, I, you know, I, I worked for somebody, uh, Monsignor Philip Murney, and he founded the National Pastoral Life Center. And uh, I, for me, he's like one of these like local saints. He's like, a, you know, somebody who in my life was kind of a saint. And um, I remember when he died, because he founded the organization. And then anything anybody wanted over the next three years, they would say, well, you know, Phil really would have wanted blank. And so they invoke the name of the person to get what they want. And there's a real danger in that of looking at today's movements and saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm really into Black Lives Matter. Yeah, she would have been in Black Lives Matter. And um, I heard um, Kate Hennessy, who um, there's a bunch of grandchildren of Dorothy Day. 
and many of them are just regular Vermont people. Um, you know, they hunt and fish and whatever, you know, I mean, I, I grew up in Louisiana. They remind me a lot of people from Louisiana, the rural people grew up poor because, you know, the mother, you know, Tamar lived, lived a life of voluntary poverty too. And, um, one of them is kind of has kind of inherited the activist Dorothy Martha Hennessy, who you may have um, you know heard about her recent trial uh, for actions on nuclear weapons, and she's actually just hopefully soon being released from prison for um, you know for uh, under the CARES Act. There's a lot of early release of nonviolent offenders. Uh, the Another grandchild is Kate Hennessy, who wrote that amazing book, um, the, uh, the World Will Be Saved by Beauty, which is sort of half biography of Dorothy, half biography of Tamar. And it's a beautiful book. I expected, like, I remember Granny. You know, I, I kind of thought it'd be a very sentimental kind of thing, but it is like no holds barred, you know, like uh, growing up in poverty, voluntary poverty is an interesting thing for the kids who did not choose it. You know, that's a pretty interesting questions come out of that, that book in, in that regard. But Kate got asked that very same question about what, 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 oh, she got asked, would Dorothy have been at the Women's March? Remember the Women's March a couple of years ago? Uh, it, it was like two weeks after the Women's March. And she, she was asked, would Dorothy be at the Women's March? And she said, I don't know, but I bet she would have been at Standing Rock, which was also in the news. Like, think of where are the poorest of the poor? Who are the people really getting pushed around? Who is being violated in our country? And who is nobody standing up for? You know, Native Americans? Well, sounds like a pretty uh, safe bet. So it's not so much looking at the causes that are big now. Like you think about, like something like uh, climate change. You know, you can kind of speculate, well, what would Dorothy say about this or that? And maybe you can find some things that are more self-help that people are doing. I mean, some great things happening in some low-income communities where people are banding together and saying, we're done being poisoned, you know? And you sort of think like, oh, would Dorothy kind of be into that? I don't know. But, you know, would she be working with the Nature Conservancy? I don't know. You know, good stuff, but I don't know if Dorothy would be doing that. So it's a it's a dangerous game, but it is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting distinction too, sort of as a mental reflection on, um, you know, where when we're standing with people for real. I don't want to say real or you know imagined issues, but when you're just showing up for social media, and when you're really showing up for for a cause, which is mm. uh, something I don't think we talk about very much. Um, did I miss a question? I feel like I missed a question. Oh, so Janice, thank you for your comment. She says, I can see her down on the border protesting the separation of kids from their parents. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I think there was a question about the misuse of Dorothy Day. Yes, I was scrolling. Thank you. I, yeah, uh, that's Isaiah, right. that's a great question. Can you comment on how the bishops use or misuse the story of Dorothy Day on our way to canonization? Yeah, and, it, and really, this is not like limited to bishops. I mean, I just see it all the time. You know, it's like the, it's, it's sort of like the Dorothy Day would have been at our rally, you know, like that, that kind of thing, like the, 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 the just deciding what it is. Like, for a while, it's interesting that this just hasn't happened. But I remember when I was first hired, there was a little bit of a buzz about, you know, would Dorothy Day be misused as, you know, the patron saint of women who have had abortions, you know, and she had an abortion. It was one of the great traumas of her life. She had a hard time talking about it. You know, I, it, you look at like her suicide attempt and the way she kind of sleepwalked through three years of her life. You know, she has this line in the um, the long loneliness where she's talking about the time when she's with, um, you know, this this you know boyfriend who you know got pregnant with and and all. And she says, you know, of these years, there is not much to say. You know, she's writing an autobiography where she gives details about all different times of her life. And she talks about this great trauma of her life. And she says, of these years, there's not much to say. 
you know, I mean, she wrote the uh, the Eleventh Virgin, the the novel, you know, it was based on her, uh, you know, experience um, and uh, with with you know the pregnancy and the boyfriend and all that, and uh, you know, I guess there's a lot to say about it. Um, but she um, was very traumatized that, by that and didn't talk a lot about it. And the only thing that we have much evidence about is she did write a letter to a woman who had had an abortion and was just very pastoral with her. Um, and, you know, just kind of like, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, things will get better, you know. Um, so I, um, I uh, think that the misuse was kind of called out, like people called that out at the beginning. Cardinal Connor talked about that, and I think maybe even, I'm not sure if Cardinal Dolan did or not, but he, um, you know, he has also been, I think he was chair of pro-life uh, committee for the USCCB, so there's like a suspicion of this. You don't really hear anything about it now. Um, but the whole thing about the misuse of Dorothy, I would like to really speak about that, which is that um, there, there is a school of thought that Dorothy should not become a saint because she will be misused. And I think it's kind of true for most of the saints. There are these stories that are made about them that aren't true. There's... Um, you know, they're invoked for this or that thing. You think of like Francis of Assisi, whose movement was just so radical, you know, and um, what does Richard Rohr call the, the birdbath, you know, the birdbath saint, you know, the people, they get co-opted, you know, like our, our secular saint, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., you know, there's, I remember when my kids, you know, they, they were, I was kind of excited. It was there, you know, they were like in first grade in kindergarten and, you know, they were going to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I said, what did you do? He said, oh, we picked up trash. You know, like, what? You know, what is that? You know, what, what's going on here? You know, how can you reduce his message to picking up trash or community service days? I don't know where that came from. It doesn't come from his writings um, or any speech he ever made. Where does that come from? So um, is that a danger? Yes. But I always tell people, you know, particularly there's, there's uh, I think, a, a, a school of thought, uh, particularly in the Catholic worker, that Dorothy will be misused. And, and my response is always not if we let them, that there has to be a, uh, a strong effort by people who care about the real story, that the real story gets told. And it doesn't get uh, kind of put in these pious stories. Like she had that her whole life, you know, like she was just started the Catholic worker. And people said, is it true that you live on the Eucharist alone? Oh, really? <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, that there was, you know, even later there was, um, oh gosh, what was her name? Um, help me out. And the, the, you know, the one, the, the, the woman who uh, started that movement in Canada, um, just put it in the chat, you're, in, you're muted. So um, anyway, there was sort of a, a, a counterpart to Dorothy who um, was uh, started her own houses of hospitality and they were, oh yeah, Dor Dorothy, Catherine Duhick Doherty. Yeah, that's, that's exactly who. And she started spreading around the story that there was a woman with syphilis in um, who had come to the Catholic worker and Dorothy had slept in the same bed as her. And Dorothy, you can read this in the letters of Dorothy Day. She, she, she wrote to her and said, would you stop doing this? This is just nonsense. You've got to stop telling the story. You know, and she's like, I'm, you know, like, I, I, you know, Tamar knows that I am, I just kick all the time in bed and, you know, you, you never, you know, no one would want to sleep in the same bed as me. And, uh, and so, you know, Catherine Doherty uh, stopped telling that story, but there's stories like that. There's the, have you heard the one about, uh, there's a priest who comes to the Catholic worker in the seventies and he's a really groovy guy. And so he doesn't have a chalice with him. So he mm -hmm. uses a coffee cup instead of a chalice in the mass. Have you heard that one? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yeah, okay. So a few few folks have heard that one. And there's a version where, well, in all of it, she just doesn't say anything because she has such reverence for priests. She doesn't interrupt him. And then there's a version of it where she finds the coffee cup, digs a hole in a backyard, <laughs> and buries it in the backyard. There's a version of it where she gets mad at the, no, the priest gets, she calls him out. The priest gets mad, throws the coffee cup in the garbage. She genuflects in front of the garbage can, takes the cup out, and then goes out in the backyard and buries it. Um, did this happen? There are people who say they remember this. The incident with the coffee cup did happen. It was Father Dan Berrigan. Mm -hmm. And the um, solution was very beautiful. Uh, Jim Forrest, who I guess is going to speak at the Bernadine Center soon, he had knew a liturgical artist who sculpted these uh, or created, he was a metal worker, he created these chalices that were very, very beautiful. And so he bought one and gave it to Dan Berrigan. And Dan Berrigan loved it. And there's a picture of him in one of the books um, presiding yeah. at mass with the new chalice. Mm. So it was a very beautiful thing. Mm. Whether Dorothy buried the other one in the, in the backyard is being debated, like I get these emails, I get copied on them, you know, and there's all these <laughs> debates going on. Some person swears he saw her doing it, but then he's like, well, I guess I remember a lot of stuff that didn't happen these days, you know, because people are old now, you know, so it's like, what kind of memory? You know, I have memories that are just based on a photograph that I saw. Now I have the memory. I've seen the picture so many times, I have the memory. So it's, it's very unclear. But back to your question, you know, about bishops misusing um, Dorothy Day is that there's a tendency for these stories to come up that didn't happen or maybe something like it happened and these embellishing you know, the genuflecting in front of the, the trash can like that didn't happen so anyway that th there is a great danger and I think that people who really care about this should be working with the um, working with the publishers of of religion textbooks on how Dorothy Day is treated. We should be working with them right now. Thank you for that. Um, Maureen posed a question. Uh, so is there an effort by members of the Catholic worker movement to stop the process of considering Dorothy for sainthood? No, you know, at one time, I don't know if that was, you know, like, I think there are opinions you know, and, and I think when, when you talk about organizing Catholic workers, you have to remember it's an anarchist movement. So it, there's not a, it's often tricky organizing things because there's a lot of different uh, views and opinions and, um, and all. Um, what I've found is more schools of thought. Um, and I have run into several Catholic workers who knew Dorothy who feel very strongly that she shouldn't be a, um, a saint. And the, the reasons people argue, and it's, and it's more than just a few, it's, it's also the, um, the, there's also a few people here and there that you run into who say, well, she said, don't call me a saint. You know, Dorothy said, don't call me a saint. I don't want to be dismissed that easily. You know, I mean, it's a little like, you know, people often say about president, like you, you kind of want somebody who doesn't want the job because it shows something about somebody's character if they're thinking about it their whole lives. Um, and we've had some good presidents who were like that, but you know, there's that school of thought. And with saints, I mean, you know, somebody who thought that she shouldn't be a saint, you know, I mean, J Dorothy used to hate it when people would come to the Catholic worker and begin to worship her, you know, to say, this is the greatest day of my life, you know? And she would just be like, get out of here, get out of here. And she, the people that she liked were the people who showed up and just said, what do you need done? And then over time, she would make sure she was sitting next to those people at dinner and got to know them. And so there's the don't call me a saint school of thought. There is the uh, and this is outside the Catholic worker. Um, this is, there's the bad mom 
school of thought um, that Dorothy was running around the country and didn't give enough attention to her daughter? What kind of saint would neglect her daughter like that? Um, that's a school of thought that has, you know, certainly the people that study Dorothy don't, don't believe that, but uh, there are people who say that. There's the, she, she was a communist, um, which is uh, actually incorrect because I guess the Communist Party didn't exist when she was, you know, a radical. She was more, more of a, really more of an anarchist than anything. You know, she was very anti-government. You know, the idea of somebody who opposed social security um, being in favor of planned economy, you know, is a, run by the government is a bit of a stretch, you know, so that's, that's usually pretty easily uh, dissuaded. And we have these articles where in the 30s, she would, there would be these Catholic newspapers that would have like, former communist speaks about the tactic, tactics of communists to, you know, brainwash people, you know, they'd use other words than that, but it was like ex-communist speaks, you know, in um, the Jesuit journal, um, Gosh, I'm, I'm spacing out on the name, but there was a Jesuit newspaper, um, Queen, uh, Queen, uh, uh, I'm, I'm spacing out on the name of it, our Queen's work, Queen's work. And they, um, they had all these articles about Dorothy talks about how the commies work. And, and it was, um, you know, I mean, clear that she was um, fighting for Jesus, you know, not for the communists. And um, that's another one. Um, Gosh, there's a couple more. Um, it, and then the, it, I, I get from some people, some radical Catholics, I won't say Catholic workers, but just radical Catholics, um, the church doesn't deserve her. And that's a, that's a troubling one for me. I mean, the other ones is just kind of like, well, you know, it's, you know, well, she wasn't a communist, you know, and, and all that. Oh, there's that she had an abortion. Um, the way it works is when someone's a candidate for sainthood, the, the attention, the close attention on the moral life begins at the moment of uh, reception into the church. So Dorothy Day had an abortion before her conversion, uh, much like St. Augustine fathered children out of wedlock before, um, you know, before he um, had his conversion. So there are several schools of thought that say Dorothy Day shouldn't be a saint. The thing is, there's like, I think like less than a hundred people in each of them. You know, it's, it's very, very small numbers of people. I mean, the, the numbers of people that just say, wow, what an amazing person, what an amazing story. What a saint for our time is in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Thank you for that. I'm a, I'm reflecting as you're speaking, Jeff, about what a different um, narrative there is around Dorothy Day than uh, maybe what I'm used to hearing around female saints. I'm thinking of like mm. Maria Goretti and how just it's a really refreshing difference for me, uh, just in terms of who we're even thinking about in terms of the lives we want to sort of hi highlight Um you know, in our faith community. So it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there is a, an interesting thing, like, you know, people don't really talk about her, her chastity, but she really, you know, she really lived a chaste life when she went into the Catholic worker. And, you know, it, nobody seems to talk about that. I mean, I don't, I don't think that's really that big, important, but I, I think of like Ammon Hennessy, who's a character that um, appears in the 50s, and is a big, Deal. He's like this really intense prophetic guy who's not Catholic, but he's Christian, and he he's just like an apostle of nonviolence. And he is so into Dorothy; he is just crazy about her. And she writes, it's great she wrote these things down. Um, she writes him a letter just saying, like, "Look, at this time of our lives, we should bring our thoughts to God and not to." Um, you know, these kinds of things, we leave that to the young people. And, you know, she's like 50 at the time, you know, I mean, it's not, you know, I'm thinking like, it's interesting, but she didn't, you know, I guess Forster was the love of her life. And that was, you know, 
that's her story. You know, she that, that he it was sort of like someone who was married and then never marries again. You know, it, that level of commitment. Yeah, I mean, really, it was a, a beautiful, a, a beautiful um, level of commitment that she had to him. Although, you know, after we we heard from a um, a woman religious who um, Dorothy, you know, did a lot of speaking to us, and she got sick one time, and the sister got in touch with us, told us the story. Um, she she got sick and she was like in bed, you know, with a fever and stuff. And so the sister nursed her back to health. And so they get to talking about their lives and stuff. And Dorothy tells the story of taking care of, of Agnes. And um, she says, you know, after Agnes died, um, Forster turns to me and says, do you want to get back together? And it was, it only took me a second to say no, but it was the longest second of my life. Isn't that something? I mean, you can see, like, she showed it, she can't be with him and she can't be without him, you know? There's different kinds of love, right? It all, it all kind of shows up in different ways. And he, incidentally, um, took communion um, from Cardinal uh, Cook at the memorial service at the cathedral. Um, Dorothy had a funeral that was kind of what they called family only, you know, like Abby Hoffman went to it, you know, I mean, there was a lot of people who weren't either Catholic workers or in the family, but it was like the, the Catholic work was saying, look, you know, for her funeral, we're not going to have a big thing at the cathedral with all these archbishops and stuff. We're going to do something small with us. And so Cardinal Cook, I mean, he was very deferential to the worker and to Dorothy all the whole time. You know, he brought her a birthday card from the Pope one time and, you know, he, he was a fan. Um, but he um, led, you know, he, he presided at the memorial service that, you know, Monsignor Higgins, the great labor priest, gave the homily and, and all. And, um, you know, that was um, where Forster took communion. And it was so interesting. After all these battles over the Catholic Church, there he is taking communion from a cardinal. Um, that's, that's, that's just so fascinating. I'm, I'm actually really excited for your graphic novel to be done. So oh, me too. <laughs> it's going to take like three more years. I'm not going anywhere, probably. I mean, you, you may have seen the incredible, you may have noticed that the art is really good in there. And that takes time, more time than I have patience for. But um, but we just wrote this, we finished the script for the chapter in the 50s, and then the, the 60s and 70s is next. Uh, and then a little thing on the, um, we'll do a little thing on the sainthood process too. Yeah, it's fast. I think it's a great medium. I saw one on uh, Father Tolton that uh, the oh, archdiocese yeah, sure. here produced, and it's lovely. So great medium. Wonderful. I think it that. Well, I'm looking at the time, and I just wanted to sort of pause again, open it up in case anyone had last minute questions. Otherwise, we can begin closing up. Not seeing any holdouts. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, wait, Maureen, please feel free to unmute yourself. Just curious, will the recording be available to us? Peter? Peter is nodding, Maureen. Yes, it will. I think it'll be shared via email um, okay. to everyone who registered. Great. Thank you so much. Everyone who registered, Peter, sorry, I'm speaking for you. Perhaps if they're patient, it'll be on YouTube shortly. Thanks, Peter. All right. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you especially to Jeff for leading us in this uh, presentation. It was really interesting and insightful. Um, yeah, lots of applause, yes. So with that, I will invite Gabriella to um, offer a, a closing prayer and thanks to Darius who has dropped off the call, but thanks to Darius for referring us for the prayer. Yes, well, this prayer might be actually a familiar one to several people on the call since it's the prayer for the intercession of servant of God, Dorothy Day. Mm -hmm. um, 
So God, our creator, your servant, Dorothy Day, exemplified the Catholic faith by, by her conversion, life of prayer and voluntary poverty, works of mercy and witness to the justice and peace of the gospel. May her life inspire people to turn to Christ as their savior and guide, to see his face in the world's poor and to raise their voices for the justice of God's kingdom. We pray that you grant the favors we ask through her intercession so that her goodness and holiness may be more widely recognized and one day the church may proclaim her saint. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. We look forward to seeing you um, at our upcoming wheel meetings. We're here most Wednesdays. Um, and thanks again to Jeff for a lovely program. Mm -hmm. Take care. Stay safe all.